Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a peace activist, philosopher, educator. He has worked extensively on different aspects of peacemaking and conflict transformation. He has mediated and intervened in more than 45 conflicts around the world, from Afghanistan, Northern Ireland, Ecuador, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. Johan Galtung has been awarded the Right Livelihood Award, often described as the Alternative Nobel Prize. He has written extensively more than a thousand articles, numerous books and publications, devised courses for peace education, and embodied, in a sense, the aspirations of the United Nations. Uh, in October recently, he celebrated his 75th birthday on the same day that the United Nations celebrated its 60th birthday. Not entirely a, a coincidence. I'm delighted to talk to you, Johann Galtung. Thank you so much. <laughs> and your long, to be here. long sort of uh, career in mediating peace. Uh, you have, in a sense, um, taken our understanding of peace beyond just the absence of war. Uh, you have brought many dimensions to peace. You're here in India uh, looking at um, development and peace. Uh, what would be a, a, a sort of a simple layperson's understanding of peace? The capacity to handle conflict non-violently, with empathy, and creativity. Mm -hmm. And I could land on a formula in Sanskrit. I could say it is not only to diminish dukkha, suffering, that would be absence of violence, but also to increase sukha. That, of course, leaves us into the difficult problem of defining sukha. Mm -hmm. But let us say that it's blossoming, unfolding, and you are closer to the development part of it. And then comes a little empirical observation, which is rather trivial, but very important. If a country is involved in a conflict which they are unable to solve, that conflict disappears into a black hole. It sucks the energy from the country. Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, India around Kashmir. Not India in general, but the whole Kashmir issue. If you want to develop, if you want to blossom, if you want sukkah, not only in economic sense, of course, then better handle your conflicts better. Mm -hmm. You have used dukkha, and, and, and dukkha really sort of derives, is, is a word commonly used in Buddhism to describe, you know, the Four Noble Truths, and we often translate uh, dukkha as, as suffering, but perhaps what it really means is mm -hmm unsatisfactoriness. Mm -hmm. mm. To, to, mm. to what degree mm. have you sort of derived some of these ideas from the Buddhist tradition? Do I sense an underlying interest or, or drawing upon? Oh, absolutely. That? Absolutely. But it came later in my life. And it came as a sort of typical reaction of the arrogant Westerner who thinks that he has seen every light that there is in the world. To realize that uh, Lord Buddha, or however you would refer to the enlightened one, had seen very much of this 2,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think this doubleness of dukkha sukkha is important. Mm -hmm. If I should talk mathematics, I would say they are orthogonal to each other. Mm -hmm. So that the task of reducing dukkha does not necessarily coincide with increasing sukkha, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there are two tasks, and uh, we who work in peace, we would anchor peace in both of them and peace mediation in both of them. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, for instance, I'm just coming back from Myanmar, mm -hmm. and it's not easy, nothing easy. But if I should say one formula, it would be not only to reduce the suffering, but also to ask the question, how could Myanmar start blossoming? How could the economy develop? How could you mobilize the creativity of everybody? Well, there are answers to that. And for that you have to solve some very knotty, difficult political, economic and nationality questions. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, ordinarily in the discourse of uh, you know, Buddhism or looking at uh, uh, I I issues such as uh, Dukkha, we tend to, in error perhaps, really look at these as uh, purely personal processes, yeah. you know, the things that we ascribe mm -hmm. and, and feel uh, and experience as individuals. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you have, have located these both in the context of the resolution of uh, uh, individual conflicts in a sense, juxtaposed with conflicts between communities, if you use the word nationalities, with the micro, with the macro in a sense. Yeah, we use four words starting <laughs> with M, the micro, uh -huh. the, uh, which would be interpersonal, intrapersonal. And I share with you the feeling that Buddhism tends to be having a point of gravity there, the meso, inside society. And maybe the Buddhist response has been a little bit excessively withdrawing in the Sangha and enjoying the life of internal purification and the best relations to your co-inhabitants. Then the macro. And uh, that is between societies, states, and between nations. Then the mega, between regions and between civilizations. So we try to work at all levels. You know, much of your uh, in writing and, and, and work has been uh, at the macro level. And before we move to that, and, and that is in some senses the public visible thrust mm -hmm. of, of your work and, and, mm -hmm. and your career, mm -hmm. well, before we sort of move out of this, this micro uh, dimension of this, um, what is the process? What are, what are the sort of underlying assumptions? Uh, what would you, what would you teach? What would you suggest to the that there might be the key principles of of, of uh, resolving, working through micro interpersonal conflicts, conflicts within ourselves, conflicts between human beings, one and one, husbands and wives, parents and children, and employers and employees, and. You start with empathy. You start with trying putting yourself, as they say, in the shoes or inside the mind of the other person. You even ask the uncomfortable question, how do I look from that other person's point of view? And if you can manage a sufficient compassion, as the Dalai Lama emphasizes so much, you start then getting rid of this anger that eats up your heart. Now, the next step, I would say, is creativity. And I'm not always so sure that Buddhists always are good at that, because that's a question of trying to see a new reality which you and your spouse could enter, or you and your neighbor. And my experience is that when a conflict has gone on for a long time, it's like trying to solve the problem of 5 minus 7 without knowing about negative numbers. You can manage 7 minus 5. But 5 minus 7, you need a new mathematics. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you need some new element. The element could be to move. It could be to change profession. It could be to refurnish your apartment. It could simply be to dress differently. But some new element is needed. And all of this you try to do non-violently. So empathy creativity and non-violence. Mm -hmm. We'll come right and back to say, applying that on, 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 on a macro scale. Well, in that's a exactly the point. Just. In a moment. Exactly. You're watching a conversation with the peace activist, educator and philosopher, Johan Galtung. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Johan Galtung. We've just been talking about resolving interpersonal conflicts of, uh, uh, you know, using pr principles of uh, empathy, creativity, and non-violence. Uh, how, how would you begin to apply, say, the principle of empathy between, between nations and, and conflicts between nations? When I'm mediating, let me say that my first question is almost always the same. Uh, what does the Middle East look like that you would like to live in? And uh, the answer I get is, with that other party, impossible. Okay. <laughs> Could we <laughs> leave that aside just for five minutes? I promise you we get back to that. But would you be so kind and dream a little bit about it? And you get the party to do that. And you ask, how do you think the other party, the third party, would answer the same question? So the guy may say, you know better than me because you probably have asked him. So I said, you have a point there, but nevertheless. Mm -hmm then you have quite a lot of material with which to work, you see. Well, transpose this. I know that, that uh, you, know, you have been quite emphatic in pointing out that you know, when you come into India, you look at India beyond Kashmir and, or, 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 or the problems in, uh, Assam. In, in Assam and the Northeast, the and, and, and there is a totality of India. Mm. But uh, I, I guess it's inescapable that, that, that Kashmir is the focus of so much passion and attention. So locate this discourse, this, this, this unfolding. Having been here about 50 times, 
I hand on heart can say I admire so much of Indian politics. I mean, to be able out of more than 1,000 million people to have linguistic pluralism that is working, federation that is working, let us disregard the mess in the Northeast for a second, Kashmir, and to have a democracy on top of this. And we all know all the problems there are, and we also know that there is a tendency to stumble on a cow who is blocking the street once in a while. Now, God bless that cow. I like that cow, actually. <laughs> the, uh, you go ahead with that, and you, you, you notice the misery, but you also notice that 200, 250 million Indians today have what you could call a European standard of living. It took us more time. And we have been ravished by wars that you haven't had. We haven't had a war between the Dravidian and the Aryan part of India, for instance. No. All these are admirable things. And we who work in this field, we have to take care that we register the peace there is, and not only the unpeace. Well, let's understand that peace. Uh, is, is it just sort of uh, a, a civilizational it? accident? It's uh, not an accident. It's not an incident. I think there is a very high level of tolerance. Mm -hmm. I don't think you will easily find a civilization, a state in the world, with so much tolerance as the Indian one. You know, there's, there, you there find is sort of the discomfort, strangest. There's, there's discomfort with the notion of tolerance. Wouldn't you say no. there's a celebration of diversity? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say that, because I'm not so sure I can say that. I feel the same discomfort. I have sort of four stages. The worst is intolerance. Tolerance means I'm so great that I tolerate that you exist. That's the negative aspect. But it gives refuge for others. I mean, you have Parsis there, you have Christians of all kinds of denominations all over the place. You have not been very kind to Buddhists, if I may say so, <laughs> because they came too close. That was too competitive. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go on from that one, the third stage is dialogue. I find lots of dialogue, too. I'm not so sure that I find much of the fourth stage, the mutual learning. Not so sure of that. Mm -hmm. But let us celebrate the fact also, even if tolerance is a negative term, which it is to me, that it exists. That makes linguistic pluralism possible. Could have been an imposition of Hindi all over the place. There were those who wanted. There were those who wanted imposition of English all over the place. Well, it didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. I, I celebrate it. There could have been those who wanted an imposition of a particular party doctrine all over the place. You have competitive. You have the idea that nobody has a monopoly on truth. It's already something. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. More than 1,000 million. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can manage, maybe the world can manage. Maybe one day we have global elections. Mm -hmm. In that case, India would have been the pioneer. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could elect the parliament for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. You kindly observe that I turned 75 and you am 60. I'm in better health. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think mean. if I should analyze it, <laughs> you see, it's been given to me the fantastic blessing that I can do what I believe in. The UN is not permitted to do what it believes in because it's crippled by somebody else whose name also started starts with a U. <laughs> who exercises not only a political veto but also an economic veto. So well, that's, that's by and large the formula. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching a conversation with Johan Galtung. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with the peace activist, philosopher, educator, Johan Galtung. I really want to move on to, to, to what in, in, in global terms is seen as, as the dominant conflict, I suppose, uh, and, and then that is the problem of terrorism, of inter-religious uh, conflict. As someone who has been interested in um, uh, Buddhism, and then and you were born a, you know, a Protestant and then left the church when you were quite young. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, 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 what could begin a dialogue between faiths that would begin to develop you know, confidence and trust? Well, first of all, I think you have to recognize that there are two terrorisms at work here. One is organized by people without uniform and another by, by people in uniform. Mm -hmm. And the latter one kills about 99.5 percent, mm -hmm. and the one without uniform about 0.5 percent. Mm -hmm. But it kills in the West, and the West doesn't like that because it's not used to it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are in a war, don't be surprised if the war is a two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest maybe you can purify our language and just drop that word terrorism. Mm -hmm. Point two, I don't think it's religious. I think it's historical. 
and that 5% is religious because the religious people articulate it best. Now, what's the historical base? Okay. I think it is 1916, the sykes picot treason. Mm -hmm. If you Arabs stand up and get rid of the Turks, we'll give you freedom, okay? France took Syria, Lebanon, and England took Palestine, Iraq. Mm -hmm. Palestine was divided by Churchill in two parts. You know what happens. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the terrorism in the U.S., there's an additional point. Mm -hmm. The treaty with Saudi Arabia in 1945, where U.S. got access to the oil, they had been there for some time already, mm -hmm. but under the condition of protecting the royal house against its own people. So that's Wahhabism. Wahhabism is not violent, but very puritanical, very incompatible with oil money. Mm -hmm. Okay, that has been with us, and it exploded in 2001, 9-11. In the Spanish case, Spanish colonialism in Morocco, mm -hmm. killing thousands in the bombing of Jaén in the 1920s under Generalissimo Franco, mm -hmm. and Ceuta Melilla, the two enclaves, the non-integration of Moroccan labor, and so on. Mm -hmm. All of this is there and has to be cleared up. Now, conclusion. Spain has cleared it up. Mm -hmm. Pulled their troops out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. India wisely did not enter promulgated a law whereby Moroccan labor, who is illegal, which is illegal, but have secured a job, will be legalized. In addition to that, Zapatero, the prime minister, himself went travel to the king of Morocco, no doubt, in order to discuss Ceuta Melilla, yes, and they organized a dialogue of civilization. These are sort of uh, initiatives, you know, by governments, in a sense, and, and, and structures, and, and what have you. You know, you have so powerfully, as an individual, impacted the understanding of peace, of, of, of empowered uh, peace activists, uh, developed education for, for, for people to study processes of peace. What faith do you have in individuals and, and their ability to impact what seem like huge global problems uh, as, as a result of historical, partly errors, partly sort of ambitions of that time. We have a very heavy load of peace <laughs> studies, very heavy load of peace studies in Spain, mm -hmm. and the governmental party is very much in contact with it. Mm -hmm. When they organized the Dialogue of Civilizations in Madrid, I was one of the invitees sitting at the top table. I'm just mentioning it as an example. Out of the things that could be done, Spain has done a lot. Bush and Tony Blair have done nothing. My conclusion, I may be wrong, but I think I can guarantee there will be no major bombing in Spain, and there will be in UK and USA. UK and USA, please look to Madrid and learn. And when you now emphasize common people, people in general peace education, it's all underneath. You prepared an atmosphere out of which maybe a prime minister feels comfortable. He feels he has not exactly drawn it from his own political milieu and from the political caste, mm -hmm. but he feels he's somehow on the right way. In, in, you, know, you were able to focus, you did focus in, in, uh, in, 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 in the early part of your uh, writings and work and on two very important context, uh, concepts, and one was sort of structural violence, mm -hmm. and also that, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, what makes news and, and, and in the manner in which news is reported and, and how that, in some senses, often can inhibit processes of peace. Give us, as the, as the American universities would say, a 101 on structural violence. <laughs> the violence that has no author, there's no actor behind it. It is just working and churning out death. And it kills to the tune of at least 100,000 per day. People who starve to death, 25,000 all over the world. And people who die from preventable and curable diseases, there are particularly the seven diseases. If money had been available, if funds had been available, if things had been done better, all of this could have been avoided. It causes immense suffering. That's the structural violence. Now, peace journalism. Yes. <laughs> that has to do with you people. And the point about it is this. If journalists could learn whenever there is an act of violence, and I'm not saying they shouldn't report violence, so obviously it has to be reported. But if they could ask two additional questions, Mr. Prime Minister, what's the underlying conflict? 
Because if the only report of violence, the report of smoke, the conflict, unresolved, is the fire. And the Prime Minister says this and that. And the second question, Mr. Prime Minister, is there any solution to this conflict? The Prime Minister will feel uncomfortable because he feels very comfortable in telling the audience that the violent people are evil. Mm -hmm. Just simply sheer evil. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't believe in evil. Mm -hmm. And that's again my snip of Buddhism, you see. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I believe in our possibility to improve ourselves, mm -hmm. to see more deeply and do things better. Johan Galtung, you have spent a lifetime in the pursuit of peace. Do you think that universal, complete, total peace is possible? No. Do you sort of no. <laughs> and I don't believe that universal, complete health is possible. <laughs> and I think it's, um, in a sense, not the right question. But I think we can handle it better. We can have less suffering. We can turn conflicts into a more positive direction. But we will always have them. And there will occasionally be violence. We could try to push it back like we have improved our lives. 25 years extra life and less morbidity through persistently pursuing health. Thank you very much. It's so been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure.